The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow or the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me. Good morning, church. I hope you're having a blessed day today. Today, we're going to take some time and we're not going to specifically read a psalm, but we're going to talk about the life of David for just a few minutes. And this is going to be a shorter lesson today. We're not going to go the full time today, but I just want to give a, a short synopsis lesson on the life of David. Because over the past couple of days, we've been talking about Psalm chapter 68. And there's certain things that David saw. And David understood that it's dynamically different than what we understand in the church corporately as a whole. Now, there are certain people in the church and certain groups in the church that have been studying the end time narrative and have been studying the generation in which the Lord will return for a long time. And there are certain people that have a right perspective. They have a right paradigm. They have a right understanding of the, of the word of God when it comes to the, the generation in which the Lord returns. But for the vast majority of the church right now on the earth, the church is almost completely illiterate. They don't know most of these truths. And because of what we experienced in Chicago, and if you were not around for that period of time, uh, when we were in the city of Chicago, we spent almost two years in Chicago. God called me there. And at the very end of that, you know, when we were preaching faith, you know, when we preached the fullness of God, when we preached different things dealing with purpose, we were received by a lot of people. But when we started preaching the end time narrative and the preparing of yourself, we were wholly rejected. There's only two people in all of Chicago right now that I know of that still supports the ministry. And that's one of our elders of the church. So technically they're both elders in the church. Now that's very interesting because to teach such dynamic truths like provision and obedience, like our divine purpose curriculum, that caused so many people to see power of God on their lives and to, to teach the truths out of our BSM discipleship curriculum that changed lives all across the country. We had a curriculum's in eight states right now, eight or nine. I have to go back and count. But we've seen the Lord do radically amazing things in our lives and through this church. And, but it's when I started teaching end time prophecy that even the faithful supporters of the ministry turned their back on us. And you might say, Cody, why is that? Well, it's very simple. It's a very simple answer. Um, I stood up and rebuked them <laughs> very, very clearly. That's, you know, if you're if you want one on one on church growth, that's probably not the way to do it. But it was a strong rebuke because I said we have to study what the word of God says pertaining to the generation in which the Lord returns. It wasn't a rebuke saying, you're wrong, I'm right, on a specific doctrine. I was just making a point that we don't know. This is very interesting, and this is why I want to talk about the life of David for just a few minutes today. Is the fact that David had such dynamic revelation from God. Not only of his own life, I mean, David was a powerful king. He was a warrior king. He was a lovesick warrior king. He, he was lovesick. He was a he was one of the great psalmists of Israel. He wrote, many, obviously, we did Psalm 68 this week, which is a psalm of David. David was called a friend of God. So David touched the heart of God in some very specific ways. He never avenged himself. 
he had saw the man that was chasing him with an army to try to kill David at a sword's length. He could have killed Saul in the night two different times. Because David had his, he cut the, what, he cut his garment and he took, I think he took his sword or his spear the other time. I mean, David did some things that were radically different than what most people would do today. They would avenge themselves. They killed the man that was chasing them. Yet David spared Saul's life twice. That's, you know, that's the righteousness of David. And David was blessed because of that. There's so many different things to talk about when it comes to the life of David. Now, David made a lot of very bad mistakes. You know, God told him to, to not leave Israel. And God, and he ran to Ziklag. You know, D David did exactly the opposite of what God told him. God said, don't go. And, you know, through the prophet, David did it anyway. You know, David saw Bathsheba, took her and killed Uriah the Hittite. You know, like it was, it was ungodly and he paid a price for it. God said the sword would never leave his house. He had to run from his son Absalom for a long time. You know why? Because David committed adultery. Not only did he commit adultery, he committed murder. He had somebody killed. You know, so th there's things that David did not do right in his life. Then there are some powerful things he did right. He vowed a vow unto God and he swore that he would build the temple. Now, because the sword never left his house, he couldn't do that. But he passed that on to his son Solomon and Solomon built the temple. So there are some amazing things David did. David killed a lion. He killed a bear. And he killed Goliath. You know, he lied to the high priest to get food in which he also got the sword of Goliath. I mean, David did some things in the Bible that were, I mean, you could say they were very controversial. You know, he went and lived with the Philistines and lied to them the whole time he was there. You know, it's, David was not a perfect man by any means. David was a powerful king. He was lovesick for God, and he's a man that made a lot of mistakes. He was a man. <laughs> Literally, he was a man. He took Bathsheba. He, he did a lot of things that were wrong. He did a lot of things that were right. And, you know, Jesus came out of the lineage of David. David has an inheritance for all of eternity because of things. You know, I mean, so many different powerful truths. But here's what I want you to understand about the life of David. This is the part I really want you to catch, because we just did like a whole overview a lot of different things in David's life. You know, good things and bad things. Praised and worshiped God, ran from God, committed adultery, had somebody killed. I mean, lots of different things. Yet one thing you see is David prophesied of the generation in which the Lord returned over and over and over. When he wrote the Psalms, there are tons of passages in the Psalms that we've read. We've read a bunch of them so far in which David would write a Psalm and not only would it affect his generation, but he would prophesy of the generation in which the Lord returns. So here's the question. This is the thing I want you to ponder today. How did David have so much dynamic revelation of the Lord that we don't know right now? There's something that David experienced of God that was so different than what the church today as a whole experiences of God. You know, if David understood the connection between God's judgments and worshiping God, why does the church as a whole reject that truth today? Like, why is the church illiterate on the Lord Jesus returning and David could prophesy it 2,500 years in advance? You know, these are, these are certain things that really have been touching my heart over the past, you know, couple weeks as we've been teaching end time prophecy. Not only to see truth be reiterated over and over, meaning when you see a truth in the Bible once, it's powerful. But when you see a truth in the Bible three, four, five times, you really have to stop and question, do I really understand what's being said? Because if it's that important that God brings it up over and over, maybe I really need to study it. Maybe I really don't understand how important that is. And that's why we're studying these chapters in great detail. But there's something about the life of David that really just touched me this week because I realized it's not just that David knew it. It's not just that David prophesied of it. But it's the fact he prophesied about it so many times. You know, if 
It's one thing for Daniel to interpret the vision of Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 2. It's a different thing entirely to get the vision himself in Daniel 7. It's a whole different thing to have Daniel 8, 9, and then 10, 11, 12. To have four visions at the end of the, the latter part of your life. I mean, that's important. To understand that, that Daniel encountered something of God very different than we do today. The same thing that David had such a dynamic relationship with the Lord, had such great insight and really believed in the character of God in a way so much of the church doesn't today. Now, here's the thing. The Spirit of God came upon people in the Old Testament and moved upon them, but they didn't receive the fullness of the promise that you have right now. The Spirit came on them. The Spirit lives in you. You have a greater manifestation of God you have all of the fullness of the Godhead dwelling inside of you bodily right now that they did not have. Yet when you ask so many people in the church, they look back at the Old Testament prophets like Daniel and Ezekiel and even David and Saul. You know what I mean? They look at these Old Testament people that had such amazing relationships with God and they think, why can I not have that? And I just sit there and look at them and ask the question, you can have that. Number one, you can have that type of relationship with God. But two, why do we keep looking at these Old Testament guys thinking that we can't have it? They had less of a portion of the Spirit of God than you have right now. They had less access to God than you do right now. Yet they knew more about who God is and His character and actually walked in the fullness of experiencing that character more than most people do in the church today. David worshiped God when God brought forth the judgment. Yet there's so many people in church that see them as separate and they're not equal. You know, and these are things that I just wanted you to think about in the life of David. It was on my heart. It's been on my heart. It's still on my heart right now. Every time we read these Psalms and we read different things about the life of David, because like I said, he wasn't perfect. There was no salvation for David in his generation. Salvation didn't take place later until Jesus came and paid for it on the cross. You know, he didn't have the indwelling of the presence of God on the inside of his, his in, in his spirit. David didn't have the things that you have now. He didn't have the fullness of the Godhead dwelling inside of him bodily. Yet you do. So you have greater manifestations of God's purpose, plan. You have the spirit that guides you and tells you all truth and all of those things. Yet so many people experience such a lesser degree of God than what David did. And you can experience as much and more than David. So we really need to look at David's life and we can learn a lot from it on how to worship God, how to praise God, how to seek God in the night in all kinds of different ways. So the life of David is very powerful. And I just want you to look at it today and understanding David saw things you didn't see. David understood things you might not understand. But you have a greater way and you can understand them because you have the Spirit of God on the inside of you and you can learn these things. Father, bless these people in Jesus' name. I give you all the glory. Amen and amen. Church, I love you. God bless you. Have a great day and we will see you tomorrow. The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow or oh, the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me. You take good care of me. And you know what I need before I even ask the thing. And you hold me in your hand with the kindness. The sun's not worried about the winter 